Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Raymond Crape. I am a professor of history at Cornell University, and the title of my talk is Sing Like a Country Club, Libertarian Exit, Imperialism, and Capitalism. And just before we get started, I wanted to thank the organizers uh, for putting this together. I'm excited to participate and, uh, and looking forward to uh, the, the talks and conversations. So I'm going to talk about libertarian exit. Um, I should explain what I mean by this very quickly. Uh, here I'm talking largely about sort of Anglophone libertarians and their relationship to anarchism. Anarcho-capitalism is not a thing. These are individuals that are hyper-capitalist. Uh, you could pick out people like Murray Rothbard, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman. They cover a spectrum between uh, very intensely anti-status to sort of night watchman state kind of perspectives. Uh, but I would include all of those individuals uh, under the sort of general rubric of libertarian because they share certain kinds of world views, I think, uh, and these are six points in particular. One is disdain for the welfare and regulatory state, uh, not the state per se, but the welfare and regulatory state. Uh, second is a kind of radical embrace of the idea of free enterprise, uh, which is their basic understanding of capitalism as free enterprise. Uh, a fetishization of the individual, uh, the individual as the site of uh, freedom uh, and of being, not the social. Uh, a fear of the masses, often based on their own experiences with totalitarianism, whether it was uh, Stalin's uh, Soviet Union or, uh, or Nazi Germany uh, or others. Um, a conflation of communism, socialism, and fascism, especially starting uh, in the late 1940s and into the 1950s and after. Uh, so no differentiation uh, between communism, socialism, and fascism, seeing them all as equally and similarly totalitarian. And finally, an ontology that equates individual private property rights with uh, freedom. And I think it's fair to say that, that the, the folks I talk about as libertarians generally share these kinds of perspectives. My exit, uh, this is Matt Damon here on the right in the film Elysium, which is a, a uh, sort of not a not, not a great version uh, of this, but uh, but actually very prescient in certain kinds of ways. But the idea of exit here for libertarians is to leave the nation state as we know it and to create a new country or a new entity that's run entirely along or largely along transactional market lines. The idea is here to kind of live up to and fulfill in territorial fashion the idea that the market is sovereign, not the state. The market is sovereign and states only exist uh, as the minimalist thing you need to enforce contractual market relations. Uh, for many of these individuals, they would refer to this as a moral experiment. This is not merely about avoiding taxation and avoiding regulation and so forth, uh, although that's certainly important, um, but it's also a kind of moral experiment in which they claim that a certain kind of level of freedom can be achieved uh, in this fashion. Uh, so the idea here is that exit is not a means to an end. You don't exit in order to somehow or another find more freedom, but the right of exit itself uh, is fundamentally part of that freedom, that you have a right to opt into and opt out of societies with the ease of a consumer. And in fact, the consumer becomes the kind of model for understanding opting in and opting out of. It's a very problematic uh, perspective, as you can imagine, because the vast majority of the population in the world is constrained in terms of opting into and opting out of things, not just by the political entity known as the nation state, but also by the political entity known as the market. But anyway, uh, I digress. Okay. Uh, the history of exit, there's a long history to exit, if you're interested in it. Uh, I have a book coming out in February that goes into this in much more detail. Uh, especially for the period of the 60s and 70s, but there's a very long history to this. You can think of company states, uh, in, including Wakefield's New Zealand Common Colonization Company. You can think about the efforts to create private kingdoms, uh, the man who would be king, um, Gregor McGregor in Honduras in the early 19th century, the private contract uh, colonization that happened in parts of Africa in the late 19th century. And then you can also look at the era as I do, especially after post-World War II, in which you have, in particular, very wealthy capitalists in the United States, uh, in particular, that are opposed to the New Deal, uh, and to Bretton Woods and various kinds of global organizations that came out of World War II. Uh, 
uh, and a broader array of their allies internationally who were opposed to a kind of post-war regulatory consensus. By the 1960s, they're increasingly worried about monetary collapse uh, because of the era of stagflation. They're worried about political totalitarianism because they misread social movements such as the civil rights movement, second wave feminism and the like, and also ecological collapse. Uh, it's worth keeping in mind that in 1968, you have something like Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons, a deeply misinformed reading of how the commons works. Uh, you have the creation of the Club of Rome, a very conservative organization concerned with uh, demography, uh, Malthusian understandings uh, of society. Uh, you have you know, books being written like Make Room, Make Room, all about demographic collapse. That would be the that would be the book that would inspire the film Soiling Green that came out with Charlton Heston in 1973. Um, in 1968, another 1968 phenomenon, the Airlex population bomb, filled with catastrophic scenarios uh, about demographic collapse and famine uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of, sort of ecological anxiety in the 1960s, along with political and monetary anxiety that is pushing people to think about exit. So it's not surprising that you have things like future shock and efforts to talk about orbital space colonization and so forth already happening in 1968 and so forth. That stuff has just now got ratcheted up uh, in a more significant way with contemporary projects, uh, building on uh, some of the aspirations and ideas of the 1960s and the 1970s, but now blending them with uh, the kind of tech libertarian um, uh, impulse that comes out of Silicon Valley. And there's a couple of things, uh, a couple of these projects that uh, I wanna talk about here. Um, one is seasteading and the other is free private cities. These are both, um, projects that in, at some level you could look at as phases in the sort of neoliberal and libertarian uh, revolution. I mean, beginning in the late 1970s and the early 1980s with Reagan, with Thatcher, with the IMF and the World Bank, um, you begin to see a radical uh, shift, uh, of course. And so you're beginning to see austerity measures, uh, increasing efforts to kind of cut the legs out of uh, the, the social safety nets uh, of the welfare state and the like. And at this point in the 80s and 90s, and it's quite interesting for many libertarians, you didn't need to territorially exit, you could just socially secede. Uh, you could move into common interest developments, private gated communities, you can move your money offshore, you do a whole array of things that didn't require you to actually territorially uh, exit uh, in any way, shape or form. But there's still this emphasis on territorial exit because of, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of the kind of moral uh, experiment. Right? Increasingly now for the seasteaders and for the free private city folks, the idea is not just the moral experiment, but in fact, the hope that their projects will succeed and then rebound onto contemporary existing nation states and actually reshape them. So they actually have this very Nietzschean sensibility in which they want to bend reality to their will. They actually want to not just exit, but they want to exit and then have their experiments rebound onto uh, uh, the existing universe that we all occupy. Seasteading uh, started formally in 2008 with the creation of the Seasteading Institute um, by Patrick Friedman, uh, who's the grandson of Milton Friedman. Uh, Patry was influenced by uh, Burning Man and this, this idea that somehow or another Burning Man was a model for uh, not a seven day uh, art festival in the desert, but in fact, uh, society as a whole. And Peter Thiel, uh, famous Silicon Valley iconoclast, uh, founder of PayPal, early investor in Facebook and the like. Peter Thiel gave a $500,000 investment to the Seasteading Institute and they got underway in 2008. And the idea of the Seasteading Institute was to build sovereign private floating platforms on the high seas. And the reason they went to the high seas is because it was understood, at least from their perspective, that the only place where one could find uh, a territory, right, a space on, that one could colonize that was not already under the control of a sovereign entity uh, was the high seas. It's a little bit of a misreading of legal theory regarding the high seas. I won't go into detail about that. Uh, there's a lot of uh, legal questions around whether or not one can actually do something that's on the high seas. It doesn't matter. They were foiled anyways by the fact that engineering issues uh, caused a lot of uh, difficulties for them, ballasting versus fixed platforms and so forth. 
but also the question of labor costs, the basic question of labor costs. If you're way out in the middle of the ocean, uh, the labor costs are absolutely outrageous. So, um, so the seasteaders have had to kind of move closer to shore in recent years. Uh, ideologically and intellectually, they're inspired by uh, a number of people. Um, there's a very famous book from 1997, The Sovereign Individual, written by um, a uh, English baron uh, and uh, a friend of his who's an investment specialist. Uh, and there's also the neo-reactionary movement associated with Mencius Moldbug, otherwise known as Curtis Yarvin, uh, with Nick Land and the accelerationist movement uh, and others. Uh, who have embraced uh, the idea that democracy is uh, not good for freedom. Uh, and in fact, one needs to kind of embrace a sort of uh, intensely capitalist uh, uh, market uh, in order to find freedom and that the politics needs to modify to that. And so they, they aspire or they, they tout things like neocameralism, the recreation of monarchies, uh, looking at sort of feudalist uh, forms uh, of politics uh, and the like. There's even, you know, a German philosopher, a German-American philosopher, Hans Hermann Hope, uh, who suggests that, um, that in fact, taken from Gerhard Hardin, the whole idea is that politics should be understood in the same way the commons is understood, that only if you have a private owner uh, of politics will the private owner actually invest in its constituency and so on and so forth. But if you have democratic politics in, in which people are moving in and out of office, all they'll do is use the office to enrich themselves rather than look out for the well being of everybody. Right? So the idea is lords and serfs, right? And we're the serfs. There's also an ecological pitch to the seasteaders uh, as they've moved closer to shore because of labor costs to places like Tahiti, for example. They have suggested that they, you know, they're sort of picking up on the sustainability green economy here, trying to look kind of, you know, groovy and new age. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, they're a perfect solution for climate refugees, that you can build these very expensive sovereign uh, entities, and that uh, if people are displaced by rising seawaters, that they could live on these seasteads and so forth. But of course, how anybody would afford a seastead, uh, given the exorbitant costs involved, and uh, the idea that somehow or another the people who do buy these seasteads will welcome climate refugees onto them um, seems uh, frankly unrealistic, if not uh, somewhat uh, absurd. So part of this has to do, of course, with the ways in which they're selling um, uh, a certain form of um, uh, a certain form of sovereignty uh, and a certain kind of way of thinking uh, about. Uh, climate change and solutions to climate change, but this really is a kind of real estate speculative sales pitch. That's the current reality of seasteading, uh, not as pretty as the other picture, uh, and this is a seastead that was uh, briefly put up off the coast of Thailand until the guy and his girlfriend who put it up uh, had to flee when, uh, when uh, the Thai Navy pursued them uh, with, um, with charges to arrest them and detain them. Now, the other project here is Free Private Cities in Honduras, and I'll talk about that a little bit and then uh, finish up. So uh, as seasteading has basically run into a lot of different problems, a lot of the people who are involved in seasteading and looking to, to kind of raise venture capital out of it have moved on shore, back on shore, you might say. And one of the places they've gone is where a lot of people have gone to kind of uh, explore their dreams and fantasies about being in the world, and that's Central America, which has always been a kind of hyper-modern experimental location uh, for people in various kinds of ways. Uh, there's a long tradition of thinking about um, creating sort of laissez-faire cities and the like. Here's just one example of many. Ayn Rand wondered what would happen if an undeveloped host country were to lease an area of 100 square uh, miles to 1,000 free market individuals and give them the 50-year free reign to administer the area without government rule. Well, that's essentially kind of what's unfolded. Laissez-faire city didn't go anywhere. I've tried to get in contact with them with no, uh, uh, no luck. Uh, but that is pretty much what's unfolding uh, in Honduras right now. It started off with charter cities. Uh, these were the ideas of Paul Romer. Uh, Paul Romer was an economist at Stanford, now an economist at NYU. He's chief economist at the World Bank for a period of time. He's won the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, and he was trying to figure out uh, new ways to think about development aid uh, and, and meditating on the fact that, that current forms of development aid have not seemed to do what they were intended to do. So his idea was to create uh, charter cities. And these would be urban 
areas uh, that would be on uh, territory in a country like Madagascar or Honduras, but the land would actually be ceded uh, to a kind of international board of investors, not permanently, but under a very long lease. Uh, few, if any, aspects of the constitution of the country would apply. Uh, these are places that would have their own autonomous police and judiciary. They would not be subject to the democratic will of the populace in the countries where they're founded. Uh, in certain cases, at least in the case of Honduras now, there would be no extradition uh, and the like. But the idea was to, was to create a city that people could go to if they wanted to, but if they didn't want to, they didn't have to uh, go to. This raised a lot of hackles, of course, because the question of seeding sovereign territory like this uh, smacked of colonial enclaves, and there were lots of accusations of colonialism, neocolonialism directed at Romer. And then there was also the problem, of course, that uh, this was negotiated with an illegal regime in Honduras because of the coup in 2009, right? So coup in Madagascar in 2009 brought Romer's ideas to an end in Madagascar. A coup in Honduras in 2009 revitalized those ideas because the coup regime was very interested in them. And they, in fact, pursued this and began to develop uh, and uh, put into a legal form the idea of zeves, economic development zones, that would be these kinds of spaces where land, sovereign territory would, in fact, be ceded to a kind of international board uh, of some kind. It varies. Uh, a lot of interest after 2009 in these uh, from tech bros uh, from Silicon Valley, Patrick Friedman being one, uh, another one, Michael Strong, a uh, very strange figure, uh, and, and a variety of others. Um, you also had ex-Reagan officials uh, closely involved, uh, many of them who cut their teeth uh, politically uh, on uh, in Central America uh, during the, the horrific wars that the Reagan administration waged in Central America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras, uh, Guatemala. Uh, these included people like Grover Norquist, who famously uh, foisted his anti-tax pledge on anybody running for Congress. Uh, Mark Klugman, who's a speechwriter for uh, Reagan, but also worked with Jose Piñera, who was part of the dictator Augusto Pinochet's administration in Chile, um, and a variety of other things. Klugman has been quite closely involved with a lot of the stuff in Honduras in the 90s and the 2000s. Um, other individuals, Mark Skousen and so forth. Uh, international right-wing networks have also been closely involved in this, in particular the Atlas Foundation, which is a kind of libertarian free enterprise uh, right-wing network uh, throughout, distributed throughout the Americas uh, that has been deeply involved in attempting to get progressive administrations out of power in places like Brazil uh, and, uh, and, and has also been closely associated with some of the things going on in Honduras. Unlike seasteading and a lot of these other projects, Laissez Fair City and so forth, uh, the Free Private Cities Initiative in Honduras looks to be going forward. Uh, and one of the places it's going forward is on the island of Roatan uh, on the Atlantic coast in the Bay Islands. Um, I can point out the irony here that you have libertarians uh, who are anti-statist working closely with a murderous illegal state and one that is clearly involved uh, in, in some capacity with narco trafficking. Uh, this is also a regime that has invested heavily in supporting uh, investors in palm oil plantations, ecologically super destructive, uh, in the development of Jatropha oil seed, uh, in, um, in confirming and supporting export processing zones where certain kinds of labor regulations and so forth don't apply. So uh, incredibly problematic. But Roatan Island is where this project seems to be going forward. The uh, project is called Roatan Prospera. Uh, there's an advisory board for Roatan Prospera. It's made up of a lot of people who aren't from Honduras, uh, and it's all men. You have people like Patrick Schumacher, who's uh, a self-described anarcho-capitalist architect with Zaya Hadid, architects based out of London, very famous um, uh, architectural firm. Um, you have Paul Critchlow, former vice chairman of Bank of America, and Merrill Lynch. You have Joel Baumgar, who's a congressman from Mississippi, uh, free market advocate, uh, but also a social conservative, opposes abortion and, and, and the like. This is not uncommon. There's a lot of uh, folks who, who are self-described libertarians uh, uh, who are also deeply socially uh, conservative uh, and, and even more problematic than that. 
the Council General for the Netherlands and so forth. And then lastly, the trade lawyer and lobbyist Shankar Singham. Uh, some people call him the brains behind Brexit. I'm not sure that brains and Brexit go in the same phrase, but, uh, but if they did, he's evidently it. Uh, but then his detractors have compared him to, uh, uh, this is quite amusing, Chauncey Gardner, uh, Peter Sellers figure in the film being there who issues these brief banalities and the political class uh, sees them as pieces of Zen profundity. Okay. So you have these, these characters involved, none of them are related to others. Uh, all of them uh, are uh, on the right wing of, uh, end of the spectrum, uh, all of them on the board of Rowett and uh, Prospero. And this is going forward. Um, Roatan Prospero has 58 acres uh, on, on, on the island, uh, and there's claims that they won't be using eminent domain to expand. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, phase one uh, of their own website shows an initial 58-acre footprint, and then it shows a phase two with a town, and then it shows a phase three with a city. So it's going to expand beyond the 58 acres, and it's not clear who's going to have control over eminent domain. Uh, here, but clearly the leaders of Roat and Prospera believe that they have the rights to uh, declare eminent domain. It's a major issue, and there's been enormous resistance on the island uh, to uh, uh, Roat and Prospera. Okay, in sum, just very quickly, uh, speculative nonfiction. Uh, what we're talking about here are imaginative and investment futures. Uh, we're talking about libertarian states. That's not a contradiction. Uh, libertarians are looking for the market to be sovereign and a night watchman state to be constructed to ensure the sovereignty of the market. Um, there's questions here about who exits, who has the right to exit, who has the right to remain, especially when we're talking about a place like Honduras, where huge numbers of people have had to leave the country and put themselves at an extraordinary risk. Uh, and then of course, get to the border of the United States where they're persecuted and abused and separated from their children and so forth. Um, a big point here, exit is expensive, not just for those who are trying to buy in, these projects are very expensive, uh, but for the rest of us who cannot. First of all, the projects from the 60s and the 70s created economic and political turmoil in places that were decolonizing, but you think about today and things like seasteads and SpaceX rockets and, and so forth, uh, these are things that are dependent on forms of human labor, on extractivism, extrusionism, which damages the planet uh, for the rest of us who, who who live here and have to live here while these uh, folks try to colonize the high seas and colonize Mars and colonize the moon and so forth. Private exit outsources expenses onto the, the public. Okay? Uh, the, ec the ecological and political costs of exit technologies are not ac externalities for, for all of us. Uh, and in the meantime, exit promoters benefit from taxpayer subsidies, from corporate welfare, from international free trade agreements uh, and so on and so forth. So exit is not a neutral act. It may be perceived as or promoted as a kind of moral experiment, but the problem is it, it often happens uh, uh, in immoral uh, ways. Uh, Mike Davis has written that the only realistic scenario in which climate change is addressed equitably uh, is one in which the, the wealthy do not have preferential exit option. And there's been good writing about uh, why a movement of certain ways and exit in certain ways should be restricted, actually, as a moral question, as a philosophical, political, moral question. Uh, question. Now, this is not necessarily an argument for further hardening of national borders or containing the populist or, or restricting people's movements. Uh, but uh, the crux of the argument here is not necessarily exit, but the term preferential, which highlights the uh, incredible inequities and the possibilities for and the consequences of exit. Uh, and just to conclude here, what that means is, is that preferential exit under unequal conditions is not benign withdrawal in the pursuit of autonomy and self-government libertarian experimentation and so on and so forth. It's a continuation of the long history of class warfare by other means. Thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, the conversation.